Yes, Mr. Williams. May I please, Your Lordship? So I turn briefly to the procedural history in this case as far as it's relevant to our grounds. And if, if I may do this by reference to the contents of paragraph 8 onwards of our skeleton argument, because that's the most expeditious way I can do it in the circumstances. As you are aware, the contract continuation order was first made uh, in June 2017, 30th of June. Although there was a reserve judgment, which you will have seen referred to dated the 26th of September 2017, I should say a written judgment. In fact, judgment wasn't reserved, it was announced orally on the 30th of June 2017, but was then confirmed in writing subsequently. So the original grant of the order stemmed from June 2017. It, it is a point of relevance, given the way that Mr Justice Lewis uh, dealt with the matter. Um, as we have emphasised uh, in uh, paragraph 9, the findings that Employment Judge Stewart made on that first occasion that were never successfully appealed. Uh, and in relation to that, I think we probably do need to look at the documents, but uh, hopefully quite briefly. So his uh, decision begins at page 287 of the document bundle. <coughs> the first point to note about it appears at page 290, paragraphs 4 and 5. The employment judge didn't hear oral evidence and he determined the matter on the basis of witness statements that were before him. Secondly, uh, my lords, if you turn to page 301, it is from paragraph 67 onwards that the judge's conclusions on the various matters that were in dispute before him between the parties were set out. Firstly, at 67, he took the view the claim had a pretty good chance, pretty good prospects of determining that she was an employee. Then he went on to deal with the various um, statutory criteria for establishing a protected disclosure, set out his um, conclusions on that in relation to 68 to 71, and it was part of that, it was his reasoning in 70 that was successfully appealed in the appeal heard by um, Her Honour Judge Edie, she then was. Uh, and then, so that was his conclusion at 72 on protected disclosure, and then at 73 as to whether the protected disclosure has resulted in dismissal, he sets out his reasoning and then his conclusions at 77 on the next page. I think the claimant stands a pretty good chance of success in showing the reason for her dismissal was because she made a protected disclosure and therefore she is entitled to interim relief. So, Mills, that conclusion was made in June 2017 and has never been successfully appealed. It was in fact a ground of appeal before her on the judge ID, but it was one that failed. And well, that is important on the given the reasoning of Mr Justice Lewis, who appears to have considered, we'll look at his reasoning shortly, that if he remitted the interim relief issue, then the employment judge would determine afresh whether the claimant had a pretty good chance of showing she was dismissed by reason of her protected disclosures. But in fact, on remittance, that issue would not have been before the employment judge <coughs> because it had already been lawfully concluded in the claimant's favour in June 2017. And the earlier remission from Harana Judge Edie's decision was limited to two points only, as we will um, see very shortly. Firstly, <coughs> the protected disclosure conclusion that I referred to. It was in particular the public interest element of that. And secondly, that nowhere in this decision, although the issue had been raised before him, was illegality dealt with. And we see that if we then come on to uh, the um, order 
made by Her Honour uh, Judge Edie. The hearing was in December 2017 and the first order that she made was sealed on the 22nd of December 2017. You'll see that in the supplementary bundle at page 44. You only need to look at it briefly at all just to confirm that point that those were the two grounds on which the appeal succeeded. And you will also see from her order that the parties were going to lodge submissions to disposal, written submissions. Now, in the interest of time, uh, my lords, and because it's not an issue directly, I, I won't take you to the passages in her judgment, but the references to where she decided that the employment judge had heard can be seen in paragraph 10 of our skeleton. Her Honour Judge Edie then made a second order after receiving written submissions on disposal, which one sees at page 251 of the main document bundle. That order was sealed on the 15th of February 2018. <coughs> 251, did you say? Yes, my lord. Thank you. <coughs> now, before we come on to what she ordered on that occasion, the state of play up to that point, and can I just give you the cross reference, is paragraph 39 of the Employment Appeal Tribunal's decision. The state of play was that the respondent had paid monthly instalments under the contract continuation order from effectively representing payments from the date of dismissal until a date in late 2017. Those payments, as I understand it, appear to have amounted to approximately £15,300. Upon Her Honour Judge Edie's decision in December, 22nd of December, the respondents stopped paying, although at that point there had been no setting aside of the contract continuation order. But it was then set aside in this order we see at page uh, 251. But it's very clear that the reconsideration going back to the ET was limited to the two issues where it had been found that the employment judge erred. And you can see that from paragraph 1. <clears throat> and you can see it in the reasoning from paragraph 6, Roman numeral 1. But there can be no doubt whatsoever about this point. That the conclusion previously reached in June that the claimant had a pretty good chance of showing she was dismissed by reason of protected disclosure, the causation issue, still stood in her favour. And then, my lords, the second aspect to note from um, this order and the reasons, if you look on the facing page under paragraph 6 at Roman numerals 5 and 6, you'll see that Her Honour Judge Edie notes that from the point of setting aside the order, there was no continuing obligation on the appellant to make payments. But in the next paragraph, she declines to order that monies... Um, that had already been paid should be repaid because at that stage it was unclear whether the order would be reinstated on the remittance or not. So that was the state of play at that juncture. Picking up the, the history, if I may, in paragraph 13 of our skeleton and not turning this document up, but at a case management hearing then in March 2018, employment judge Stewart determined amongst other things, that he would consider the remitted issues on the basis of the material that was before him in June 2017. We've given the references to that in 
our paragraph 13. And there was no challenge by the respondent to that conclusion. As we know, the hearing of the paragraph 14 of our skeleton, the hearing of the permitted interim relief took place on the 23rd of April 2018, but then there was then that very long delay before <coughs> Employment Judge Stewart gave his decision, which he was physically handed to the parties during the substantive hearing. What we do see confirmed uh, in his November decision, if you look at page 210 of the bundle, please, paragraph 2, First, I should say, paragraph one again confirms that his reconsideration <coughs> is limited to those two issues. So that's page 209. And then paragraph two, that he's going to determine it on the basis of the material that was before him in June 2017. We know from the summary of the history that you have already been given that he determined both the remitted issues in the claimant's <coughs> favour as regards the protected disclosure, it was the public interest element of the definition, the definition met. There was then no further appeal against that conclusion, so that was lawfully determined in the claimant's favour. But the way in which he dealt with illegality at paragraph 15 onwards was the subject of a further appeal by the respondent and a successful appeal to Mr Justice Lewis. If one reads the employment judge's reasoning, it's not hard to see why the appeal succeeded, because essentially he didn't direct himself in accordance with the relevant authorities. And we have made no complaint, raised no appeal about that, that conclusion. Plainly, Mr Justice Lewis was correct to find that the employment judge erred in misdirecting himself as to the illegality test. One further feature uh, to notice is that when the respondent appealed this November decision, Stuart 2, as it's called as a shorthand in Merlin's own skeleton, the respondent also asked the Employment Appeal Tribunal to stay further payments that were due under the contract continuation order. Because given that Employment Judge Stewart had reinstated it on the face of it. Those payments that had stopped in December 2017 were now due for the period January to November 2018. And Mr Justice Sewell, who sifted the appeal through to a full hearing, declined to grant that stay, and you can see that at page 50 of the supplementary bundle. So in fact, had the respondent complied with the order that had been made below, those additional payments should have been made to the claimant before the appeal hearing took place, before Mr Justice Lewis, the respondent having unsuccessfully applied for a stay. But the respondent simply didn't make those payments in breach of the order. As regards the reconsideration element, as you know from the chronology described to you yesterday, when asked to reconsider his decision after the outcome of the substantive hearing was known, Employment Judge Stewart declined to do so. The references are in page 15 of our skeleton, but I don't think it will add to the arguments at this stage to take you uh, to that. When reference are made to injustice, alleged injustice in this case, in, in addition to the points about the way that the statutory scheme operates that I made this morning, we respectfully submit it is relevant to note that the claimant, if matters stand, as Mr Justice Lewis decided, then with the contraction, contract, contract continuation order set aside, then the claimant is liable to repay that 15,000 odd pounds. 
I'm sorry, I, 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 it's my fault. I, I haven't followed what, what, why was there a liability to repay? Because if the order simply set aside, at least on the respondent's case, there might, I don't want to preclude the fact that the claimant might want to argue at any subsequent well, quite. hearing in the county court that she wasn't liable to, but on the respondent's case, she is liable to repay. She faces that jeopardy, if I can put it that way. That would be a more accurate way of putting it. I see. She you, faces you, that. Even though payments were made pursuant to an apparently valid order it's at valid the time. At the time, yes. Well, okay, well, if they want to argue that, leave that. They will. Well, but that's what one talks about. My learned friends, reading my learned friends' skeleton, it would seem as if the uh, points relating to justice were all in the direction of his client's favour. We make the point that if ma as matters stand, the claimant is in that potential jeopardy, a jeopardy that she could not, in our respectful submission, have foreseen at the time when the application was originally made, because she would have reasonably believed on the basis of the existing case law that the ultimate decision made at the merits hearing would have no bearing. Uh, on entitlements under the um, interim um, uh, relief order. Secondly, my Lord, had the respondent complied with the order, then the claimant should have received the balance of the payments, which then, pursuant to my Lord, Lord Justice Singh's uh, observation, the respondent would then have to take his chances, presumably in the county court, in, in arguing for their recovery. The plain fact of the matter is that the respondent hasn't made those payments. And now the order has been set aside. That makes it difficult for the claimant uh, to, to to argue um, in, in that kind of arena uh, that the payments should be made to her. Uh, but nonetheless, they should have been made prior to the um, EAT hearing before Mr. Justice Lewis. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to have to go into all of this. and Maybe we are. I don't know. But I would just want to put down a marker that, that, that there's quite a lot of learning in public law cases about this sort of problem and, and, and what in public law has become known as the relative theory of nullity. It's potentially very deep waters. Um, I hope we're not going to have in, the, in this case. <coughs> if we are, then we will. Um, but I, I wouldn't <coughs> necessarily assume that uh, payments which have not yet been made, have to be made, or that payments which were made, pursuant to an apparently valid order at the time, have to be repaid. I mean, that might have to be argued about in, in subsequent proceedings, well, look, but I, I, I don't I, think it's an issue before us, is it? I entirely take that point. I was simply, in, if you like, it's background, simply yes. make the point that the in, alleged injustice doesn't all flow in one direction. I see. It's not essential for resolution of our grounds of appeal to which I uh, turn. Um, in, in in shallower waters, Miss um, <laughs> Williams, what what's the period of time during which you say the respondent was ordered to pay further interim payments but but didn't? Uh, well, it, it it ends with the hearing before Mr. Justice Lewis, but but when does it start? Well, I'll have to look back at the model the way that um, employment judge uh, Stewart phrased it in his order. If you'll um, give me a moment, he. You'll see it to page 209 of the uh, bundle. He simply ordered that the contract between the parties shall continue, but that's the contract running from dismissal, until determination of or settlement of the complaint with payment monthly of the net sum, the same figure as before. So basically, that meant that any arrears that at that st the order was reinstated and therefore any arrears which had accrued, given that payments had stopped at the end of 2017 then became payable once this order was made in November 2018. Right, thank you. Well, we'll join the threads together for the grounds of uh, appeal and the structure then is as follows. Ground one relates to the proposition that uh, the uh, learned judge, uh, having rightly concluded that Employment Judge Stewart made an error, misdirected himself, uh, that uh, it followed uh, that the order be set aside. We say he should have first argued, he should have first asked, was the misdirection material? 
on his own reasoning about illegality, it wasn't. That's all I need to say about ground one. It's a very short point. But if we're right about ground one, one doesn't even get to the stage of the order being set aside. Grounds two and three go to Mr Justice Lewis's conclusion that although he had set aside the order, he would not remit the question of interim relief uh, because, as I foreshadowed this morning, that the Employment Tribunal would necessarily dismiss the application. In other words, the issue could only be answered one way. And the reason he said they would dismiss the application is because it was now known that the Section 103A, the ERA, the protected disclosure unfair dismissal claim had failed. Grounds two and three both go to that point. I'll come on to ground four, which goes to the reconsideration. Ground three, in effect, aug augments ground two. I, I realistically accept if I don't win on ground two, I'm unlikely to win on ground three. Uh, it effectively supplements ground two, so I'll focus on that. And we deal with this in our skeleton from paragraph 71 onwards, where we submit that the EAT's conclusion that the only decision the employment judge could make on remission was to dismiss the interim relief application was wrong in law for several reasons. I'm just going to go for his reasons. Whilst doing so, it's useful to remind ourselves what Mr Justice Lewis said in paragraphs um, 111 onwards, which is page 172 of the bundle. Page 172, and the key paragraphs are 111, 112, 113, and 115. My laws would like to um, remind themselves of, of those passages. point and the wider point. The narrower point is that these passages indicate that Mr Justice Lewis was under the impression that were he to remit the issue, the employment judge would redetermine whether the claimant had a pretty good chance of showing she was dismissed for making protected disclosures. And that is most clearly seen by the sentences, firstly by B and secondly between C and D, page 174. And for the reasons that I've shown your lordships in relation to the chronology, that is simply wrong. The matter was remitted. The only question that the employment <coughs> judge would consider on remission was illegality. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't follow that. Uh, I know that uh, Judge Edie remitted on two points, but what would there be to stop Mr Justice Lewis saying this is going to be at large? Well, because... The, the, the other issues were not before him. There was no challenge to the findings on the other issues. Um, I, I, I'm afraid, speaking for myself, I find this completely unreal because if the order is set aside, the order is set aside. The order has to be decided again. And it may be the analogy <coughs> with public law remedies is not exact. But if a judicial review court 
quashes the Secretary of State's decision and remits it to be reconsidered in accordance with law. It's completely unreal to say the Secretary of State must reconsider according to some fictitious set of facts rather than the up-to-date set of facts. Well, my Lord, we would appreciate your Lord's comment, but we would respectfully say not. Firstly, it is very commonplace when an error of law is detected in the Employment Appeal Tribunal to remit on specific issues as opposed to it reopening. Well, no, I understand that. And Judge Eady did something. No, what, what Judge Eady did was entirely proper. I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I, I, I'm merely questioning whether that is always and necessarily required, given that unusually in this situation, you now knew what the outcome of the final hearing was. I'll, t I'll come on to my broader point then, because I'm very conscious of time, but that, that is, the, as it were, the narrow point we make. I see. That the learned judge um, misunderstood that the issues <coughs> of the legality were, were still at large when there'd be no appeal in relation to them. But the broader point, uh, my Lord, uh, is that um, Mr Justice uh, Lewis proceeded on the basis that the outcome of the substantive hearing would now be something material for the employment judge to take into account when reconsidering on remission the contract continuation order. And we respectfully submit that that is not the appropriate line to take in keeping with all the authorities and judicial understanding that I took you to this morning, the outcome of the substantive complaint is simply immaterial to the grant or refusal of interim relief. It has no bearing on it whatsoever. And it have a bearing on whether there's a pretty good chance of succeeding on a particular point? We respectfully <coughs> say my lord that in, on this point employment judge stewart was right when it was remitted beforehand and would be right to take the same approach on this uh, uh, occasion too that it is to be considered on the material that the judge had before him at the time of the interim relief hearing it is no fault of the claimants that he uh, twice in a row made errors of law and so the matter had to be remitted uh, and he was quite right to find that the matter should have been determined on the material that he had before him in june 2017. And if that's right, then what, uh, which I appreciate is an if, but if that's right, then uh, it uh, simply becomes irrelevant <coughs> in terms of what has happened thereafter. As I mentioned this morning, we say the claimant was entitled to a lawful determination of the application that she properly brought uh, uh, on the scenario uh, that the judge faced at the time when the application was properly brought. And it's only because of the employment judge's errors and delay that we're in this unfortunate situation. Ms Williams, this, this can't be a unique situation. Maybe it is, but uh, I know in the employment context, no one's found another authority, but in many contexts, for example, when uh, we were first instance judges, we would, we would frequently be sitting in the interim applications court. And, and you do your best often on a, in a summary hearing uh, and, and you make an order uh, usually until further order or until trial uh, you might set a return date now, I'm just envisaging on the remitted hearing in this case what, what are you saying the employment judge would have to do presumably they'd have to specify some dates in the date of the interim order because it is an interim order it'd be from presumably the date of the order would it the, not, not, not from June 2017? If the order was reinstated, the order would be similar to that made by Employment yes, Judge Stewart in November. And we accept would only run to the substantive hearing. We haven't suggested yeah. it would run beyond Well, the, but the substantive hearing has now already happened. So, so I, I'm just having difficulty in seeing what the terms of an order are going to look like, whether they're going <coughs> to specify a date in the past. The order would run until the conclusion of the substantive <coughs> hearing, and that would mean that the monies that would have fallen due each month between January and November 2018 became payable to the claimant. And on your submission, would then be irrecoverable? Yes, consistent with the way <coughs> in which the statutory scheme operates. And, and what about interest? Uh, to, 
of us I hadn't come as far as specifically no, the, thinking the, about that. The it, it, it may be a relevant consideration as one aspect of the point my Lord is, is raising. Um, <clears throat> it, it is the passage of time to be ignored for the purposes of, of interest? As far as I'm aware, there was no application for interest made in relation to Stuart II. Um, so I, I'm not in a position to positively say that there would have been an application for interest made had the matter been remitted again. Right. Okay. This is an entitlement that your client's entitled to, irrespective of the outcome of the proceedings. Yes, because that's the whole way that the statutory scheme operates. I, I do understand why it feels counterintuitive, but it is the whole way statutory scheme operates, the claim is satisfied in relation to everything but the illegality issue, and she would have satisfied it, that in relation to that as well had it been lawfully determined that she met the statutory criteria. She it's not really interim relief pending determination. That would be a mischaracterization of it, wouldn't it? Well, it would have been oh. if it had been determined at the, correctly at the correct time. Ms. Williams, speaking for myself, I, I don't have any, and subject to any submission, I don't have any difficulty with the proposition that the outcome of a final hearing, whether in employment law or in general civil law, isn't uh, relevant to the correctness of an interim decision, which has already been made. That, that, that's commonplace. It turns out at trial, the final injunction is refused. The interim applications judge doing their best in court 37 gave an interim injunction. Turns out they shouldn't have done. That doesn't mean that it was improperly made, unlawfully made, that actions which have been performed in accordance with it have suddenly been rendered unlawful. All of that, subject to further submissions, I can appreciate. But that's very different. <laughs> that's, that's the normal chrono chronology where you have an interim order, which is truly interim, you then have the final trial, and then you know the outcome of the proceedings at the end of the day. Here, what's happened is that the EAT is asked to remit an interim application <coughs> in circumstances where everyone now knows the outcome of the final trial. And it just seems completely unrealistic to me to say that they're required to do and, 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 and that the EJ is required to determine the application on a completely false basis. Well, my lord, the central point that we make is that the claimant was, and I appreciate I may be repeating myself, but the claimant is entitled to a lawful determination yes, of the application. It wasn't her fault that things I'm, went to uh, uh, And employment judge Stewart was correct, and it wasn't appealed when he previously determined at the case management in March 2000. And 18, um, that he, that he um, approached matters on the basis of the material as it stood in uh, uh, June 2017. I don't think I can improve no. upon those, those points. I mean, it, put it. to what extent does your submission turn on the fact that the remedy, any award, if, if may, any sum paid, is irrecoverable? My Lord, the fact that it is irrecoverable is a strong indication that the whole way the scheme operates and which Parliament intended it to operate is that the outcome of the substantive hearing has no bearing on the grant or refusal of interim relief. I mean, the point. It's simply relevant. It seems to me that, the, that, that, that assuming as we, the question of whether or not the, the assumption about irrecoverability is right is not before us, so let's proceed on the basis that that's right. But that's a feature of the interim scheme, because of the nature of the of of, of, of of all the circumstances. It doesn't elevate the right. It seems to me the, it doesn't elevate elevate the right uh, to the relief to one which the claimant is entitled to seek at any point, even after the determination of the claim. Well, my lord, our argument. That is, I mean, that is. It seems to me that insofar as it, that your argument does is based on the recoverability of the any sum paid, it seems to me that that's my first current feeling is that it's a, it's a it's not a persuasive argument because the irrecoverability 
is a necessary feature of the interim scheme for reasons we were discussing earlier, compared to other areas where interim relief is claimed. I understand the point. I think the point that you're putting to my Lord and Lord Justice um, Singh was putting to me is that the key point here <coughs> is that the outcome is already known uh, by the time on our um, proposition the employment judge would be asked to consider whether interim relief should be granted. But we do say in that context it is relevant to observe that under the scheme the substantive outcome is, is, is irrelevant. Because it's only because the, the, the problem that your Lordship had with the proposition that it should be, returned, <coughs> should be um, reconsidered by the tribunal on remission is the fact that the substantive outcome has occurred. Can I go back? I asked you a rather clumsily worded question this morning when you were the statutory provisions, but it's about appeal. The <coughs> Section 130 of the 1996 Act provides that the, <coughs> the order for continuation will run until the determination or settlement of the complaint. And you <coughs> indicated a moment ago that you accepted that, that was the determination at first instance, in effect. Well, that's certainly the way that both parties have proceeded in this case, so I... Yeah, but, but uh, okay. uh, again, I'm afraid, I'm just going to ask what the basis is. Uh, <coughs> we, we've heard quite a lot about the, the way these things are always done. Um, you, you said that appeal provisions are the appeal provisions r r relative to, to other orders. But, but is there something which says one way or another, if you lose at first instance and win on appeal, is there something which says that your claim was determined at the later hearing, not at the later hearing? No, my lord, there's nothing specific in that regard. Right. My lord, the only other authorities I'm going to show you on this point, and it, it raises the question rather than answers it, but it perhaps shows that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was alive to the fact that these sort of issues could arise. Uh, in a case uh, is, um, once I've done this, I'm just going to very, very quickly deal with reconsideration, is the uh, Parsons case, which is at 363. I won't take up time now going through the chronology of events. It's dealt with in our skeleton. We raised it as an example of showing how this case isn't unique, how it is not difficult to posit a situation whereby uh, interim relief order either granted or refused appeal to the EAT by the time the matter is remitted to the tribunal, substantive hearing has taken place. Uh, and in that regard, it's pertinent to note there's nothing unusual at all about the procedural steps in this case, perfectly um, bog standard periods of time for, for things to be done. So um, if we can just turn very briefly to Parsons, which as I say, uh, is at uh, page 363. So without taking up time going through the chronology, but as we've explained in our skeleton, uh, cross-references paragraph 84, this was a case where the appeal against the refusal of interim relief was being heard in February, and you'll see from the dates on the first page that judgment was handed down in March, uh, and the substantive hearing was also to take place in March. In fact, the appeal failed, so that was the end of it. But had the appeal succeeded, the question would have arisen in that case rem of remitting the interim relief order, and if so, on what basis? And so it, it's in that regard, and it raises the questions rather than answers them, but I show your Lordships this to, just to illustrate that this is not the first time these sort of issues have potentially arisen. In His Honour Judge Shanks's judgment, you'll see in the last paragraph, at paragraph 23, sorry, 22, on page 373, you'll see that he says, in the circumstances, it's unnecessary for me to decide the interesting and difficult questions canvassed at the hearing as to whether, in the event of the appeal succeeding, it would be appropriate for the EAT to decide the interim relief application itself, or whether it should be remitted to the Employment Tribunal and if so, at what stage it should be heard by the tribunal and on what evidence? So that's raising the sort of issues uh, that uh, we've been considering. Interestingly, what isn't raised there is an option is that the EAT, even if the appeal succeeds, should just do nothing. 
uh, on the basis that this substantive hearing in March 2016 would have already um, uh, have taken place. Uh, it may be that simply again poses the questions rather than answering them, but as I say, it does show that this case mm -hmm. is not unique, uh, and this is an issue um, that um, gives uh, food for <coughs> thought. Uh, 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 speaking for myself, I think you're right that it's posing questions rather than answering them. I think notionally we might read in paragraph 23, phew. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, my Lord. Um, Ground, I'm so, so sorry. I was <coughs> taking perhaps a point more in your favour than the one I put to you a minute ago. Well, I expressed surprise that uh, this was a your proposition that it was an enforceable right as opposed to just a remedy pending determination. What the effect of section 130 is, as I read it, is that the order the contract continues. Yes, that's right. So if the contract, is it your argument, if the contract continues, then all the rights accruing under the contract continue. Well, the rights that accrue under the contract are those specified in the statute. As specified. Yes, so pay, other, fun, other benefits and continuity. So those rights continue, yes. And they continue until determination. Yes. Or uh, or uh, or settlement. Yes, my lord. My lord, shall I move swiftly on to ground four? Because I um, put time. Obviously, at the same time, I need to deal with these questions as much as I can. I can deal with it very briefly. Uh, so, ground four relates to the Allied decision that Mr. Justice Lewis made. That in any event, the employment judge was wrong to say. Uh, that he wouldn't reconsider his Stuart II um, grant, regrant of the contract continuation order because the outcome of the substantive hearing was now known and it had failed. That was dealt with by the EAT in 175 and 176. Perhaps in the interest of time, I won't ask you to, to turn it up now, but it's of a piece with the reasoning in the earlier paragraphs that we looked at. As we say in our skeleton from paragraph 82 onwards, the only basis upon which Mr Justice Lewis identified reconsideration as appropriate was the fact that it was now known that the case had failed at the substantive hearing, and you have all our submissions as to why that is simply irrelevant in terms of the question of whether interim relief should be granted or not. And the reconsideration application arose under Rule 70 uh, of the Tribunal Rules, terms are all not controversial, perhaps I can just give you the reference without looking it up, it's at page 47 in the bundle, I'm, so, I'm sorry, it's page 49, and rule 70 gives the tribunal a power to reconsider where it is, quote, necessary in the interest of justice to do so. Rule 71 provides that application is to be made within 14 days, but page 47 of the bundle, rule 5, there's a general power in the tribunal to extend time. So the proposition that it was, quote, necessary in the interest of justice, but, quote, to reconsider the proposition that Mr Justice Lewis found is entirely based on the underlying proposition that the outcome of the substantive hearing is relevant to whether interim relief is granted. And we say that that is simply incorrect for all the reasons that I addressed this morning. So even aside from the rather fiddly time point, the 14 day point, which I'll come on to briefly, the broader in principle point is it's simply incorrect to talk in terms of there being an injustice within the meaning of the Rule 70 provisions where an ultimate, where failure of the ultimate claim um, um, in a situation where an interim relief order has been granted, or indeed the other way around, it would equally be inappropriate for a claimant to say, hang on, in the interest of justice you need to reconsider <coughs> this, you refused my application for interim relief but now I've succeeded at the uh, final hearing and so, so there is a simply a misconception in the same way within those paragraphs, Mr Justice Lewis talks about the um, outcome at the final hearing showing that the interim relief decision was quote incorrect and we say again respectfully it's simply the wrong way to look at it, it's a different task, different test, different evidence one doesn't show that the other was incorrect. So, my lord, that is, my lord, that is the broader, as it were, in principle point. There is also the narrower point.
point uh, which is that in any event pursuant to the rules the application could only be made within 14 days uh, of the order of which reconsideration was sought uh, and it was because of the particular factual combination of features here that the outcome of the final hearing was known within 14 days of Stuart 2. We, and, and therefore meaning the application could be made within 14 days. But we say that is purely a matter of happenstance, again something which occurred through no fault of the claimant, and does not provide a reason in principle to distinguish this situation from what has very clearly been the principle throughout the operation of interim relief since the 1970s, <coughs> that you don't go back and um, um, reconsider the appropriateness of the grant or indeed refusal of an order based on what happened at the substantive hearing. On your broader point of principle, as I said earlier, I mean this, this can't be a unique problem in employment law. Uh, in lots and lots of contexts, the law has to take a view, sometimes urgently, in order to preserve the status quo, usually, maybe an interim injunction, something of that sort, until there can be a trial on the merits of an issue. And there must be lots of cases in which the courts have said, well, the outcome of the final case doesn't mean that the interim injunction was wrongly made. It, 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 indeed, my lord, we say what, what the respondent <coughs> argued in this case and successfully persuaded Mr Justice Lunoff is, is unprecedented. Rob. We, we have, in our skeleton, made the point that these the power to set aside a judgment on the basis of the interest of justice is a very long-standing one that has been in the tribunal rules for many years. And it is quite striking that there is no parallel to be found uh, prior to this case. Obviously, that isn't always a complete answer to a point, but it is, it is rather striking, and it does confirm our understanding of how the rules operate. The two, in contrast, the two cases that my learned friend has referred to, if I can just give you the names to... Uh, so that our submission is clear without taking you to them. He refers to Ladup and Barnes, which is page 107 plus, <coughs> and Outer Sight and Brown, which is page 268 onwards. Neither of those are anything to do with interim relief, but more importantly, they are cases where a finding was made at the substantive hearing, and then as a result of information that subsequently came to light, one was about... Was about in relation to a matter that had led to his dismissal. As a result of a matter of fact subsequently coming to light, the tribunal held that it was, in the first case, in the interest of justice, in the second case, not in the interest of justice, uh, to uh, <coughs> reconsider the factual finding made at the full merits hearing. But that's a very different scenario. Following on, um, uh, 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 Lord Lord Justice Singh makes. That's a very different situation, we say, that Rule 70 was designed to uh, cover. Uh, ineffectively, uh, the employment authorities say it goes, far, it goes further than a lad and marshal situation, but it is a situation where, for whatever reason, something comes to light after a, uh, a, a judgment has been given, findings of fact made, that um, throw doubt on it and which couldn't have been obtained earlier. But that is wor worlds away from this kind of situation where, uh, as my Lord Lord Justice Singh says, there is an interim for order made on the basis of material that is before it at that stage. The fact that a conclusion in favour of the other parties come to the final hearing simply doesn't, we say, engage this interest of justice rule at all. So we, we, we put it as broadly as that, albeit also drawing attention to the quirk in this case, uh, in relation to the 14 days, which we say affords no um, distinction of principle. Uh, we say Lord Justice Lewis was wrong to say that this case is unique, um, given the Parsons example and the example quoted in our skeleton, but even if it was unique, factually, it's still no uh, reason uh, of principle uh, to provide uh, a distinction. Uh, my Lord, even if it doesn't look like it, I am conscious of time, and so, although it's a bit of a canter through ground, uh, ground floor. I think I should stop now unless there's any further questions I can assist you with. No, thank you. No, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> yes, plenty. Uh, my Lords, I propose to deal with the interim relief cross appeal first. Mm -hmm.
or replying on the question uh, of illegality. Much of what my learned friend introduced uh, before the short adjournment in terms of statutory material, in terms of policy background, I agree with. Interim relief was introduced as a means of deterring lightning strikes by effectively providing a mechanism for those who could provide appropriate certification to the employment tribunal and satisfy the employment tribunal to the pretty likely standard, they would succeed in their ultimate claim. They would be given an interim remedy that would have the effect of uh, deterring lightning strikes. It's important to note tribunal landscape was somewhat different then. We've already seen that the statutory scheme governing interim relief makes express provision for expeditious treatment of applications for interim relief, both in terms of the presentation of the application and uh, the tribunal dealing with them. But it's important also to note that the industrial tribunal system, as it then was called, was, it was in its relative infancy, had been set up in order to provide a swift system of justice. In those days, you would get your full case on, so I'm reliably told by my elders and betters, with, but within a matter of weeks or months, the substantive hearing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad I, I'm glad I've been correctly informed in relation to that. The, the, the situ I, 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 I draw that point out now because the situation is very different. And employment law books, when I studied it, were that thin as opposed to six volumes of lever of um, I, I, I have to say, I remember, if I can, if I can just digress a little, I remember in, in, um, a, a senior silk in a different field expressing astonishment that I was going to become an employment lawyer at all on the basis that it involved no law. Well, uh, uh, he got that wrong. Yeah, they say um, the same about family law, Mr. Murray. Yes. Um, so so the, the situation is very different nowadays. And I, I am bound to observe that the policy underpinning interim relief in its now more broader sense across different jurisdictions is somewhat obscure. Plainly deterring lightning strikes is of no application in relation to somebody who brings a, a 103A whistleblowing claim. Nonetheless, I accept that as a very broad and rough and ready proposition, interim relief is available in principle in cases which have, if I can use this broad rule of thumb, some form of public interest element. That's not a complete answer, because we, as we've seen from Steer and Stormshaw, which is on its way here, um, the interim relief regime is not available in discrimination claims. That's an argument for another court for another day. I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to assist in terms of the background. It's worth pointing out, when one looks at the statutory scheme, but the primary remedy is one of reinstatement or re-engagement. And you'll have seen from, I'm, I don't, I'm not proposing to take my lords back to it, section 129 mandates a tribunal once it has found that the, that the ultimate underlying claim is likely to succeed. It must ask the employer, do you consent to reinstate or re-engage pending determination or settlement? It is only if the employer is absent from the tribunal or says no to that question that the tribunal goes on to make a continuation of contract award. Now, I agree that a key feature of uh, interim relief orders when they are made is that the assumption is that if the underlying claim is subsequently unsuccessful, money paid under a continuation of contract order will not be recoverable. I must confess, until today, it had never crossed my mind that the alternative might be arguable. But my Lord's asked the question, where do we find um, provi provision for this in the scheme? It's not expressed. There's no express prohibition. But, it, but my learned friends was right, and I'm not proposing at this very late stage to start writing a different course. There's, there's no question that over the last 45 years, the assumption has been that monies are irrecoverable, or will generally be irrecoverable if paid under a continuation of contract order. In other words, the ultimate outcome of the, of the underlying claim 
will not affect the lawfulness of monies paid or the, the possession indeed of monies paid under an earlier continuation of contract order. I also accept what Mr. Williams says in relation to that being priced into the test. As my lords may have seen from the papers, um, we were actually seeking to argue that the test ought to be higher, but we were refused permission by Lord Justice Dean to argue that point in this court on a, from a, a uh, from a ECHR perspective. I'm, I'm not trying to undo that now, obviously, obviously, but but it, it does go to to my to my uh, to my lord's point that it's possible to envisage different schemes, schemes that are. Uh, perhaps more accessible to workers or to employees, but which also have less rigidity built into them. And, and, and it's at this point that, that, that it may be helpful to make the following observation. The interim relief scheme is, as far as we are aware, wholly unique in English law in providing a substantive remedy which can and will be awarded a prize, if you like, before the race is run. <coughs> now, of course, there are interim injunction applications, interim applications of all kinds in all spheres of law. But the typical um, unifying feature of those is that where such interim <coughs> relief is ordered, it's secured on a cross undertaking and damages. Well, not always. Mm. Not interim relief. Some interim relief has to be given, which can never be uh, reversed. Mm. My lord's observation simply underlines the uh, limits of my knowledge across different areas of law. It, it, I, I did describe this this scheme as unique in providing a financial. Perhaps it'd be more accurate to describe it as a financial remedy which is linked to, co to the compensation that's ultimately sought in relation to the underlying claim. Isn't it, isn't it very similar to other kinds of interim orders, which, for example, a civil court might make, depending on the circumstances, in that it's a continuation. It, this, this is expressly a continuation of the contract for certain purposes, particularly wages. Um, it, it, it's not impossible to envisage, is it? it, it, it <coughs> sitting in court 37, a judge might say, OK, well, I've got to do my best, having regard to the balance of injustice and so on, balance of convenience test. Pending the final trial, I, 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 certain things will continue to be the case, because otherwise it'll prejudice somebody uh, and they might win at the end of the day. Well, I've got two, two, two answers, if I may, to, to that. Um, uh, First of all, it's difficult to see this in terms of a continuation of the status quo, per se, because by definition, the individual's been dismissed. I know, I know, I know, but it's a statutory deeming that the contract shall, shall be continued. Uh, uh, the other point to make in relation to this is, that, as my Lord well knows, um, uh, centuries of authority have, have um, underpinned the principle that there won't ever be um, enforcement of a contract for personal service. Yep. Again, I appreciate and, that, and, and I appreciate that this is, this is, I, I suppose, the opposite of that. This is a statutory mm. construct that works the other way, albeit ultimately this is, as Mr. Justice Kavanagh observed in the passages in the Steer and Stormshorts, Stormshore decision that you looked at. In practice, no one ever gets reinstated or re-engaged. It's always the financial remedy that's yeah. that's granted. I, 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 I hope I'm not. I'll be forgiven for giving evidence in relation to this. This being my experience. No, I, I can readily understand that this is the practical reality of the situation. And to put it crudely, Parliament didn't want, for example, the trade unionists to starve because they're not getting their wages yeah. while they're having their case determined. Absolutely, I, I completely understand that. And of course, uh, there will be cases where that's absolutely true. Now, I, I, I made the point a little while ago. That I accept the proposition that the risk of irrecoverability is priced into the test. But that does not alter the character of a case where a payment has been ordered, a continuation of contract order has been made, and the underlying claim has subsequently failed. In such a case, the respondent employer has been irretrievably prejudiced. Indeed, you were taken to Dandipat 
decision of Mr Justice Underhill on a permission application, paragraph 20, I, I, I needn't show it up again, but my Lords will, will recall that Mr Justice Underhill indicated that that is a, conclu a consequence that should not likely be imposed. So the re respondent is irretrievably prejudiced and the claimant receives a windfall. That's what happens in the case where the continuation of contract order is made and the underlying claim fails. And there's no point in my submission beating about the bush in relation to this. That is an injustice. It's an injustice to the employer. I agree it's a, it's a point that the Parliament <coughs> has, it's an injustice that Parliament is effect, has effectively tolerating. It's the price to be paid, but it is an injustice. And in the ordinary case, it may be difficult, indeed impossible, for the employer to do anything about it. Just have to take it on the chin, paid his money, and off you go. I accept that. Ms. Williams made the point that the claimant, in this case, was entitled to have a lawful determination of her application for interim relief. I accept that. Not a controversial proposition. But equally, the respondent was entitled to a lawful determination of the claimant's application for interim relief. In other words, when the application for interim relief came before the tribunal, the respondent was entitled to have it treated and dealt with according to the established principles of employment law relevant in that area, be they principles relating to protected disclosures, principles relating to illegality, and so on. And it was for that reason that Judge Stewart kept getting it wrong. And to be fair, my learned friend does not on this appeal suggest he got it right. He kept getting the law wrong every time he had to deal with the case substantively. It is worth noting what this case is about in terms in, in pure financial terms. As my learned friend very skillfully avoided putting flesh on the bones of what is actually at stake. If this cross appeal succeeds, the practical effect is to, notwithstanding the observations that, that, that Judge, that Judge Stewart's decision two and three contained errors, is to put in place a continuation of contract order, or to reinstate a continuation of contract order, whose total value is in the region of £43,000. And that's what period, please? Total period between um, dismissal in May 2017 and promulgation of the tribunal judgment, its underlying claim, in November 2018. A period of almost exactly 18 months. That's a tax-free sum payable by the respondent. To pay. I should make it clear that <coughs> some of that's already been paid. It's already in the claimant's hands. 15 odd thousand. I can't remember the precise figure. The claimant's now claiming for the balance. This is in relation to a claim that has failed the 103A automatically unfair dismissal claim for making protected disclosures. The true value of that claim is nil, as the tribunal has found. At this stage, the Court of Appeal is being asked by the claimant to effectively put in place or reinstate an order <coughs> made on the basis of a forecast that is known to be wrong. In other words, we would say, putting it bluntly, to implement an injustice. And to do so by <coughs> remitting to the tribunal a case which has now been substantively determined and insisting that the tribunal shuts its eyes to what has actually happened in reality, I'm afraid I cannot do better than adopt 
the expression that my Lord Lord Justice Singh used on more than one occasion, this is just unreal. Can you just help me with this, Mr. Worthy, about how these things work in practice? If, if we envisage the, the sort of time and scale you're talking about here, 18 months, in the context of a, a, a large employer with a large workforce and an annual pay negotiation, if at some point in that 18 months there'd been a 5% pay rise for everyone, would the interim order, would the calculation of the, of the, of the sum be increased on the relevant date to take account of the, the pay increase? Um, yes, uh, I think it would. Um, I, I, forgive my hesitancy in relation to this. If my Lord turns up, section 131, Sorry, 130, I beg your pardon. If we turn to page 32, section 130, subsection 3, subject to the following, forgive me, my lord, uh, subject to the following provisions, the amount so specified, I say that's to say the amount under the, con mm. the continuation of contract, <coughs> should be that which the employee could reasonably have been expected to earn during the period. That would, on the face of it, it's broad enough to encompass rises in pay. I can only speak from the perspective of a practitioner. It's also historically been regarded as being wide enough to encompass potential bonus awards, mm. awards of share options, all of which is unrecoverable. Things you might qualify for because a relevant anniversary fell during the Indeed. The, the relevant and period. it's all the more likely because, of, as, a, as, a, a, as people will appreciate, the backlogs that are reflecting employment tribunals, not just because of COVID, they were, they were, they're already in place. And indeed, the employment tribunals are not merely um, uh, 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 any more uh, uh, a forum for litigation of relatively low-value disputes. I mean, there are extremely high-value claims, and you, you get multi-million pound applica applications for interim relief whose value is, in fact, multi-millions of pounds. All to be sorted out on a rough-and-ready <coughs> summary assessment. And if this comes back to the point I make about it is capable of working a serious injustice upon a respondent. Now, in some circumstances, I accept, because that's what Parliament has ordained, there is no provision made for recoverability, the, the respondent has to take it on the chin. But there may be circumstances, whether by happenstance or something else, where the tribunal or the appeal tribunal can avoid that injustice occurring. This is such a case. I accept the characterization of it by my, by, by my learned friend of one which, to a certain extent, arises via happenstance through the tardiness and incorrectness of the decisions issued by, by Employment Judge Stewart. Be that as it may, the claimant has not suffered any material prejudice. All that's happened is that she hasn't got a sum of money which she probably oughtn't to have got in the first place. I mean, well, I'm not now, trying to divide it up between the 15 You now. see, at this point, I sh I, as you may have gathered, I share my Lord's initial reaction about the unreality. And it may well be that, that the unreality of the scheme it ultimately persuades us, me and us, that that you're right, but the, can I suggest there are two features of the, sta of the construction of the statute which stand in your way. The first is the unrecoverability, which su suggests that these, what is being vested in the claimant in these circumstances is inalienable rather than contingent upon the success of otherwise of the claim. And the second is the way in which the order is, is expressed. It's not that the employer shall pay to the employee a sum equivalent to what she would have been entitled to had the contract continued. It's an order for the continuation of the contract. Now, does not that effectively mean that the contract continues until the determination of the claim? I, I hope I, my Lord won't mind me answering with a question. 
Why does it matter? If the original order is made erroneously, for whatever reason, there's an error of law in the original tribunal's analysis, then however one characterises the type of order that's made under the legislation, the fact remains that the Employment Appeal Tribunal has to decide what to do with the substantive application. Right. What does it do at that point? It's at this point that it may be sensible or helpful to look at the powers of the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Um, we haven't got them in the statutory materials, but they are referred to in the Jaffrey case, which Ms Williams referred to, um, at page um, 267 of the authorities bundle. So look at this, and then um, the reconsideration provision. Right. I just want to go turn to the law. I'm, I'm only turning to Jaffrey because it inc includes a citation of section 35, subsection 1 of the Employment Tribunals Act 1996. 267. Two six six. The end of Jaffrey. Yeah, the end of Jaffrey. Uh, it's the in Lord Justice Underhill's. Yeah. Mm. And my lords will see the indented citation of <coughs> section 35 1. The purpose of disposing of an appeal, the appeal tribunal may A, exercise any of the powers of the body or officer from whom the appeal was brought, or B, remit the case to that body or officer. Can I just set this reference in context? My lords will, I hope, appreciate that my client, by the time he came to the Employment Appeal Tribunal before Mr Justice Lewis, made two separate attacks on the interim relief order. One was Stuart II, that's to say, the substantive decision. He said that his approach to illegality was all wrong. So that's the first line of attack. The second line of attack was on Stuart III, Judge Stuart's refusal to reconsider. And we only had to win on one of those for, the, for it to fall. My learned friend has to win on all parts of her cross appeal. So I've referred you to section 35.1 of the Employment Tribunals Act. It refers to the EAT being able to exercise any of the powers of the Employment Tribunal. It's useful then to look at what the relevant powers of the Employment Tribunal are in this context. Can I, I know my learned friend referred to it, but can we please turn up the relevant rules of procedure, Rule 70? That's at page 49. A, a tribunal may, either on its own initiative, open bracket, which may reflect a request from the Employment Appeal Tribunal, close bracket, or on the application of a party, reconsider any judge, any judgment, and I emphasise that, where it is necessary in the interests of justice to do so. On reconsideration, the decision may be confirmed, varied or revoked. If it is revoked, it may be taken again. And Rule 71 is, is where the 14-day time limit applies. But of course, it only applies in relation to cases where an application is made by a party. It doesn't apply where a tribunal wishes to reconsider of its own motion. Where does that leave us in this case? Mr Justice Lewis identifies that there has been an error of law made in Stuart II. He has the power to remit but he also has the power to exercise any of the, power of the powers of the body from which, uh, from which the, the appeal is taken. He recognises that there is, of course, something completely unreal about sending it back to Judge Stewart or some other judge to reconsider the discrete question of illegality in circumstances where the, the underlying claim has failed. Requiring the tribunal to shut its eyes to what has actually happened. Not to mention it, that it also encompasses the risk of a material injustice. In other words, the respondent being ordered to pay 40 odd, 42 odd thousand pounds to someone who should get nothing. And so as a matter of working this out from the perspective of the rules, 
I appreciate that um, Mr Justice Lewis doesn't express it in these terms. But in, in, in my submission, this is a satisfactory way of explaining it. He declines to remit because he recognises that upon remission, he would be obliged to direct or request that the tribunal of its own motion reconsider the broader application for interim relief in the light of the substantive finding of the tribunal. I think Ms Williams's submission is that the judge had already found there was a pretty good chance and that finding was still valid or alive or not, not appealed it, it, at that point. I, 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 I accept that part of the pretty good chance, some of the discrete elements, had been resolved in the claimant's favour <coughs> and had either not been appealed or had been unsuccessfully appealed. But why does that prevent them being from prevent them being reopened at a later point in time in the light of the substantive decision? There is nothing in Rule 70 to prevent that. On the contrary, I, I'm, I'm not proposing to take my Lords through, through the statutory history of these rules, but my Lords, I hope, will have gathered from our skeleton argument that Rule 70 <laughs> represents a compression of the previously more extensive versions of the reconsideration regime in the employment tribunal. So there used to be five different categories. They've now been compressed into a single category of interests of justice. My learned friend referred to the outer sight case, see page 68 <coughs> of the bundle. I'm not proposing to, to, to turn it up. That's a, yet another decision of her honour judge, Edie, as she then was. And, and the, the reason we've cited it is not because of the decision itself, the facts of the decision, which are of little relevance. It's for the proposition that the new Rule 70, the interests of justice test, are intended to encapsulate all of the different categories under which a review or reconsideration application was previously authorised. And those five categories included where fresh evidence emerged or where, of course, the interests of justice justified it. Hence our reference to the Ladup decision, where after judgment in a case, this is again page 107, again I'm not proposing to turn it up, but for my Lord's notes, a relatively old case, after a substantive decision of the Employment Tribunal, which found in favour of the claimant in relation to dismissal for misconduct, he was subsequently, subsequently convicted in a criminal court of the underlying offence. It came back before the Employment Tribunal, who held that it would be a blatant injustice, the EAT held, it would be a blatant injustice if the subsequent conviction was not taken into account. I'm simply referring to it as an illustration of the principle. There may be circumstances when, a, when the power to reconsider may look at other judgments. Now, I don't want to press this too far in the context of the interim relief regime. I want to make this to be absolutely clear where the limits of my argument lie. Because I wouldn't want to be seen to be pressing for a ruling which suggests that every time that an interim relief order was made, the, the mm. unsuccessful employer makes an out-of-time application for reconsideration. It doesn't arise on the circumstance of this case because fortuitously, I can't pretend anything else, fortuitously, we weren't out of time to make our application for reconsideration. But I wouldn't rule out there being cases where an interim relief, where a continuation of contract order could be challenged under Rule 70, even out of time. <clears throat> and, and nor should this court, in my submission, shy away from that conclusion. You'll have seen that there are cases, although oral evidence is typically not taken in interim relief applications, witness statements are generally prepared. Indeed, they were in this case. What if a continuation of contract order is made, i.e. a successful ap application for interim relief is presented, and at the subsequent substantive hearing, the claim fails in circumstances which make it clear that the witness evidence on which the claimant relied, the statement, was false, or that there was a document that was forged or fabricated? Now, 
On my learned friends analysis, you can never revisit an award of interim relief, a continuation of contract order. She says that as a matter of statutory construction, Rule 70, which we've just looked at, the reference to any judgment, you have to read in, in parentheses, accept judgments on interim relief applications. And you can never revisit them. No matter the circumstances in which interim relief was ordered in the first place. Would you like to suggest a principle which should be adopted in deciding whether such an application should be allowed? You've uh, given some extreme examples, forgery, etc. I, 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 it is those sorts of uh, cases. The, or, in other words, the starting point would be, ordinarily, uh, um, a grant of interim relief uh, um, or an order, a continuation of contract order would not be challenged, would not be reconsidered, forgive me, merely because the underlying claim failed. There would have to be some additional feature which justified reconsideration out of time. Because that's the typical case. I have to emphasise it's not our case because of the, the, the quirk, which means that we were we fell within the 14-day time limit. Examples of factors that to be taken into account as we're, we're in, in such applications, that's to say out-of-time applications for reconsideration, would be change of position by the claimant. In other words, where the claimant has received money under a continuation of contract order, the extent to which he or she has changed position, has relied upon it. Some um, interim relief applicants are more impecunious than others, we can put it that way. The extent to which the order granting interim relief in the first place was made on the basis of dishonesty. So it's something egregious about the, the application or the evidence I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't wish to be um, uh, all encompassing or exhaustive in terms of the factors because I, I, I have. To, forgive me for emphasising it. It isn't our case. It doesn't matter for, our, for the purposes of our case. But it's the principle that underlines the question of whether my learned friend can be right. But you can never reconsider. But it goes to the application itself for interim relief yep. rather than the merits of the claim. Absolutely. But our case, that, that's in the, in the typical case where, where there's the usual chronology, the usual sequence is followed. That's to say the application for interim relief is made, dealt with speedily, there's a gap of time, and then you have... But there was nothing, nothing of that sort in this case, was it? No, it's because, because, mm -hmm. because, because Employment Judge Stewart kept getting it wrong. And as I say, we, just like the claimant, were entitled to our fair determination of the application. And by the time we eventually got to that stage, Judge Goodman have given her judgment in the substantive hearing. And so the, the whole forecasting exercise which underpins the interim relief regime was no longer necessary. You keep saying, Mr. Daddy, that Judge Stewart kept getting it wrong. But <clears throat> it may be, I don't know, because we have no concluded views on any aspect of any of this, but it may be that ultimately we may need to draw a distinction between the... the Ground four, which deals with reconsideration, and the earlier grounds, yep. which deals with the situation where the EAT had allowed the appeal. Because suppose you have uh, a situation where there's no error of law in the interim decision, and all you have is that the final decision is different. Yep. So the claim has now failed, so we know that. Suppose you had all the same facts as you have in our case, but there's been no determination that there's been an error of law by the But the same case. sequence, the same timing. Yeah, so you stop at the point where uh, Judge Goodman decides the claim fails, so you then apply for reconsideration. Speaking for myself, at the moment, I'm having difficulty in understanding why there is at that point any basis for reconsideration because no one has said at this point the earlier decision was wrong, either because the witness statements were forged or because there was an error of law or something of that sort. All you've got is the commonplace situation that an interim order has been made and it turns out at the final trial the claim failed. So what? 
Because it's in the interests of justice. Well, maybe, but he, he said it's Well, that's it's the not. test, my lord. I know, but he decided it wasn't. The, 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 no, that's not what Judge Stewart decided on three. Judge Stewart, forgive me, I know we haven't looked at, at the Judge Stewart's decision on yes. the reconsideration application. He didn't decide it wasn't in the interests of justice. He decided that he wasn't permitted to review it and that the respondent's remedy was a claim for unjust enrichment in the county court. I'm, can I give you the reference? It's, yes. it's um, uh, page 247. It, it, I'm, I'm sorry to put it this way. Does Mr Justice Lewis deal with this? He didn't expressly, because right. it wasn't really an issue between the parties I see. That, that, that Stuart III on the reconsideration application was as erroneous as his earlier decisions for different reasons. I, I, don't, mean to, I, don't, I, don't, mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the, but the reality is each of the three decisions promulgated by him was quite problematic. Yeah. The, the difficulty, I mean, you may be right, but the difficulty we face is that the reasoning, as I read it, of Mr Justice Lewis it, on the reconsideration appeal is identical to his earlier reasoning. I, I agree that that's... Yeah. That, uh, and I, 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 I'm suggesting, he may be right, I, I'm just querying whether he's necessarily right. I, I'm just suggesting that one possible legally correct analysis is that Mr Justice Lewis was right on the earlier bit, but wrong on the reconsideration bit, uh, because it doesn't follow that somebody has got the reconsideration issue wrong just because uh, the, the other bit succeeds. I totally, I accept that. Right. I accept that conceptually yes. um, there's a different approach to be taken in relation to Stuart 2 and Stuart 3. Right. I entirely accept that. But we say that Mr Justice Lewis was right, as it happens, in relation to both, that either path was permissible. And to return to my Lord's question, assuming there's no error of law, assuming there is no Stuart II or there's no error in Stuart II, yeah. what, why should an application for reconsideration in time succeed? Mm. I, simply, I, 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 I simply turn to the test in Rule 70, because it's in the interest of justice to do so. And, and even though the scheme anticipates that there will be cases where there is an injustice, that's to say the final result is a mismatch between the, or the continuation of contract order and the final result in the underlying claim, where you are within the time limits for an application for reconsideration, having regard to the breadth of the reconsideration power, it is better for tribunals to seek an outcome which has regard to the reality of the substantive claim than a forecast to prove to be wrong. Because that's what doing justice is about. I, it, can, I, can, I can see the jurisdiction may exist. And it may be that in extreme cases, like where there's been a forgery on the basis of which the interim order was obtained, that it ought to be exercised. But, but I, well, I'm very cautious at the moment about opening the doors to anyone who, who comes along and says, look, I won, at the end of the day, I won, therefore, the interim order should be set aside, should be reconsidered, because it's, in, it's necessarily in the interest of justice. Because I won on the second time, it should never have been made in the first time. It, I, I, in my submission, my Lord is worrying about um, a floodgate scenario that just won't happen. Whether or not Mr Justice Lewis was correct to regard this, this case as unique, <coughs> the chronology is certainly extremely unusual. I, I, I've never heard of a case where the interim relief decision gets handed, down, in, handed in in the middle of the substantive hearing. I mean, typically there will be months, maybe even years, or more than a year, between the, grant, between the decision on interim relief and the substantive hearing, so it just won't arise. And and my lord needn't needn't fear a run of applications of this kind. The interim relief regime has been in place since 1975, was it? Something like something like 1975. Yes. There hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, any appellate case dealing with an application for reconsideration in or out of time. You're, you're dealing with applications, but your submission earlier and the jurisdiction question must be a more general one. You, you made the observation that Rule 70 doesn't require an application. It can be exercised of its own motion. Yeah. 
if you're saying that the interests of justice require reconsideration whenever a claim has failed, ultimately. Oh, that's not my, that's, that's, right, not, well, that's not my submission. Well, if that's not your submission, then what is your submission? My submission is that there may be circumstances where, recon, where the interests of justice require reconsideration. Right. For, there, there may be circumstances. Some cir examples of circumstances include the egregious conduct uh, examples that I gave a little earlier. Yeah. Another example is where there is effectively a coincidence in timing, as we have in this case, between the issue of the interim relief decision and the issue of the underlying decision. And there's a mismatch between them. In other words, the forecast made in the interim relief decision is very swiftly within the time limit demonstrated to be wrong. Right. I, 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 that's, my, that's my answer, my Lord. I, but I, drawing back a little bit to the broader principle or the broader issues that arise here, what, one way or another, we say, either by reference to grounds one to three or by reference to ground four, Mr Justice Lewis was correct. Um, just give me one moment, please. Can I just deal with a, um, a, a point made by my learned friend on her feet about this cutting both ways? She says that if, it, if it's okay for the employer to do it, then it must also it would also be okay for the claimant to do it. In other words, for a, a situation to arise where the claimant failed in her interim relief application, but subsequently succeeded at trial. But with respect, that's not a true converse. Because if the claimant succeeds at trial, she will be able to obtain the ordinary remedies that flow for, from a success, successful 103A claim or equivalent unfair, automatically unfair dismissal claim. She didn't have no need of interim relief. Well, is that right? necessarily right? I mean, the, the, the deemed continuation of the contract of employment has other consequences than financial ones. No. What well, about well, the continuity of... It's irrelevant in the case of an automatically unfair dismissal claim because no qualifying period is required. Right. But it might be. Suppose that she then wants to make a claim under the Sex Discrimination Act. Might it, might, might it be relevant for other statutory <coughs> rights? No. Well, there's no, no minimum qualification period. Not, not at all for a sex discrimination. So it's only, is it only for unfair dismissal claims? It's only for statutory employment claims arising under the Employment Rights Act and similar right. provisions. I can't think of any circumstance in which the non-financial elements of a continuation... In fact, there are no... The, fact, the reality is there are no non-financial elements. It, the truth is they are all financial. But um, one's not prohibited from bringing other proceedings <coughs> in circumstances where they, they don't have a qualifying period. Um, I'm at the time I'm proposing to turn to my reply on illegality. Thank you. Unless I can assist any further in relation to interim. Sorry, before, I always do this. Well, just one before last, you do. Just one last thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, may, it may be um, uh, more of a jury point in terms of analysis. I raised the point earlier that what, what, what this is like, this regime, is a case where, unusual if not unique in English law, where the prize can be awarded before the race is won, run. What's unusual about this is the claimant is still insisting upon the award of her prize after the race has been run and she knows that she has lost. And, and whichever way one approaches it, be it on grounds one to three or ground four, Lewis one, Lewis two, if I can put it that way, this court in my submission should be astute to prevent a situation arising where a claimant can effectively be awarded such a significant sum of money, 42 odd thousand pounds, in circumstances where the court knows that the underlying claim has been unsuccessful. Anyway, I, 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 I consider that, I suspect I'm repeating myself, I'm going to move to illegality. Mr. Griggs reminds me that even on an unfair dismissal case, one can't rely on a continuity of employment under a continuation of contract order to extend the qualifying period of employment. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Brees. Um, can I move to illegality? Um, in this morning's exchanges, my learned friend was asked, I think by Lord Justice Singh, what her position would be if the respondent had terminated the claimant's contract in 2014. And my learned friend, Ms. Williams, to be fair, she said no more than my job would be a bit more difficult. She did. Which, uh, with the characteristic nimble footedness by her, but it, uh, reading between the lines, it's an acknowledgement that her client would not have had a leg to stand on in relation to an illegality defence deployed in 2014. Ms. Williams invites this court to uphold the judgment of Mr. Justice Lewis in full on the illegality point. In other words, we move from position where there is no answer to the successful deployment of the illegality defence in 2014 to no way that any tribunal, any reasonable tribunal properly directing itself according to the law could accept an illegality defence two and a half years later, three years <coughs> later. And what has changed in the intervening period to affect such an extraordinary reversal? It is the actions of the respondent and that is all. And even if they are to be taken into account, they cannot, in my submission, have the effect of completely reversing the position that existed in, say... Why do you say it's the only reaction to the respondent? Why isn't it the claim performing her side of the contract for three years? I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch Why that. Why isn't it... It's not just the respondent's actions. It? The claimant has carried out her functions under the contract for a further period of three years. Uh, it's, I'm not going to repeat the submissions I made yesterday about what the claimant actually did. Let's assume, okay. for, the, let, let's assume for the sake of argument <coughs> that, the, that the claimant was good as gold and did everything that she was required to do under the contract, uh, did nothing which would attract any criticism at all. I accept that it could is, it is, in certain circumstances, a factor that could be taken into account. Well, but, can, but should it should be taken into account, shouldn't it? Uh, can I come back to that, my lord? Because if that's all that happens, it <laughs> operates as a species of adverse possession in employment. If, you, as long as you, as long as you behave well or don't perform the contract illegally for a minimum period of time, that will have the eff necessary effect of scrubbing the, scr the slate clean. It's not as black and white as that. But it, but it's it, all, it all feeds into the proportionality assessment. Well, is, is, if, if that's right, my lord, then one searches in vain in Mr Justice Lewis's decision for a rounded proportionality assessment. Hence the respondent's notice. Hence the respondent's notice, but, and I'll come back to that in due course, the Patel and Merzifat. But looking at this in the round even now, the fact that, well, I'll, I'll come back to the factors relied upon by Miss Williams, if I may, if I may, shortly. At the moment, I'm just looking at the overall position adopted on behalf of the claimant, which is that the only answer in this case is to reject the defence of illegality. Mr. Justice Lewis criticises the Employment Tribunal for having failed to carry out or having failed to consider in sufficient detail what it was about the pre-2014 conduct or having made sufficient findings about the post-2014 conduct. But he doesn't then go on to make similar, to, to, to perform a similar or desirable analysis himself. And of course he doesn't have the facts at his fingertips. It's not a fact-finding tribunal. So if it's a legitimate source of criticism, the tribunal hasn't made enough factual findings, then necessarily the matter needs to be remitted. But, 
but our position is m more fundamental. And yesterday, my Lord Lord Justice Baker asked me to, you know, where does to, to, to provide a formula, if you like, for the for the knowledge plus participation test. And um, can I attempt to do so through the prism of three employment appeal tribunal cases referred to by my learned friend, two of which have been considered in the Court of Appeal? Uh, and the first of those is Salverson, page 99. This is a decision of the Employment Appeal Tribunal in Scotland. I'm conscious of the time, so if I, if I may be forgiven, I'll, I'll be taking it at quite a lick, and I appreciate that my, that my lords have seen this already. The key points are, the illegality consisted of the separation of a small portion of the wage packet into a payment to the service company jointly owned by the claimant and his wife, a fifth of the, or a sixth of the wage packet. The advantage to the claimant is that this arrangement, which was done in conjunction with the employer, so there was joint participation, was that payment of tax could be deferred, to, and there was a more benign expenses regime. The employment tribunal found that neither realised, that's to say neither the claimant nor the respondent, realised that there was any illegality involved. The majority of the employment tribunal found that the defence of illegality was not established, but that was a decision overturned by the EAT. So this was a successful deployment of the defence of illegality. See paragraph 19 on page 105. Now, I wasn't proposing to deal with it in any more detail than that, but to invite my Lords to turn up its consideration by the Court of Appeal in Hall. If you could turn, please, to 117 in the by now familiar judgment of Lord Justice Peter Gibson. One sees at 36 a reference to Salveson and Simons. This is in the, in the context of Lord Justice Peter Gibson's review of the applicable and appropriate authorities, relevant authorities. If, if, if 36 could be read, please. Thirty-seven is a reference to the decision of his honour judge Peter Clark in another case, Joel and Adams, where to summarise, Judge Clark said even mere acquiescence by an employee in an employer's scheme would suffice to found illegality. Then we have thirty-eight, which we've looked at already. With respect to the judge, that's a reference to Judge Peter Clark in Joel and Adams. His view of the unfair dismissal cases is an oversimplified one. There's then a reference to the test that we've already looked at, knowledge plus participation. There's a reference to Coral, which we discussed yesterday, and I'm not going to, to, to go over old ground. But then there's a reference to Salverson. This is at H on page 117. The Salverson case constituting illegality, uh, Salverson case on its facts was not a case of mere knowledge of the facts constituting illegality, the employee's involvement was much greater. Now, I, I cannot pretend that this is an express approval of or agreement with Salverson, but certainly there is absolutely no indication that Lord Justice Peter Gibson disagreed with either the reasoning or the outcome in Salverson in circumstances where he had, in the same paragraph, criticised different reasoning of a different constitution of the EAT in the Joe Hal and Adams case. The second case to which I wish to refer is Damond. This is the decision of Mr Justice Underhill, as he then was, 
at page 137. Can I swiftly deal with a point that uh, I, I may have misunderstood one end friend yesterday. This is in the context of qualifying periods. But I thought I understood Prince Williams to say that the way that the Damon case was decided was on the basis of holding that the unlawful period couldn't constitute the unlawful, sorry, the, Ill, the period of illegal performance of the contract wouldn't count towards the uh, qualifying period. That, is, in my submission, is not correct. It's, in so far as that is suggested by the summary at page 137, it simply doesn't reflect the reasoning of the Employment Tribunal or the Employment Appeal Tribunal. In order to make that submission good, if you could turn, please, to page 138. Paragraph 1 sets out in characteristically pithy form the uh, keep the salient facts. Could I invite the court please just to read subparagraphs one to six? This is a case then of somebody who uh, was provided her services through a service company in circumstances where it was abundantly clear that she was an employee. She did so for just a few months subsequently brings an unfair dismissal claim. The employment tribunals, uh, uh, you can see, a, see a, the issues in front of the employment tribunal. This is at page 139. The respondent took the point that she'd only been employed for a period within the qualifying period. It was the claimant's response that she had in law been an employee throughout the period. Paragraph 3, page 140. The unfair dismissal claim was not allowed to proceed because it was tainted by illegality, not because of any qualifying period point. And this may be a convenient moment to address the point that I know my learned friend stressed on a number of occasions to you during the course of her submissions, both yesterday and today, which is that the claimant, she says, performed the contract lawfully for two years, and that's the qualifying period. And we just simply ask rhetorically, what's the magic of that? It's not a get out of jail free card. W what has that got to do with a consideration of the underlying policy principles It wasn't argued in this case that she shouldn't succeed her, in her claim because she didn't have a, a sufficient qualifying period. And there's something arbitrary about allowing the defence of illegality to succeed in relation to an unfair dismissal claim for a year and 364 days. But then for the character of the defence to change after that. Moreover, it's problematic in other respects. The defence of illegality was deployed and was successful before the Employment Tribunal in this case in relation not just to unfair dismissal, which has a qualifying period, but also wrongful dismissal, which does not, an unlawful deduction from wages claim, which has no qualifying period. With respect, I cannot see how the existence of a qualifying period of employment, even assuming that that notional period has been satisfied without illegal performance has any kind of significant effect on the overall analysis. The key point in relation to Damon, but returning to Damon, is that the Employment Appeal Tribunal upheld the finding of illegality. So again, we've got joint participation, deferral of payment of tax, plus the more benign regime. A case like Salverson, light years removed from our own. Indeed, the illegality in that case was only for a few months, because in April 2005, the claimant became, on the face of it, she entered into a formal contract of employment. Damon too has been considered in the Court of Appeal. 
we turn please to uh, Enfield and Payne, page 162. Uh, sorry, page 160, I beg your pardon. One hundred and sixty takes us to the judgment of Lord Justice Pill. One can pick it up at paragraphs twenty four and twenty five, page one hundred and sixty. First, to the judgment of Mr. Justice Elias in the Employment Appeal Tribunal in the Enfield and Payne case, where he considered both Salverson and Damon. Paragraph 25. In his judgment, Mr. Justice Elias analysed the above and other authorities in some detail. I agree with his analysis and with the statement. In our judgment, the essential feature of all the cases where there has been found to be illegality is that the parties have knowingly entered into arrangements which, which have to their knowledge represented the facts of the employment relationship to be other than that that they really are. I've already cited the general conclusion of the appeal tribunal at their paragraph 46, then this. I agree with their further statement that while the decision in Damon and Enterprise South Devon was correct, the width of Mr Justice Underhill's remarks at paragraph 12 cited above, and I don't rely on those for the avoidance of doubt, was too broad. It's important in my submission that Lord Justice Peel agrees with the decision in Damon. Now, to, 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 for the sake of completeness, I should also refer to the judgment of Lord Justice Lloyd at 162. Paragraph 37, he agrees with Lord Justice Pillars to the principles, and I would draw attention to the final two lines on page 162. In a case of this kind, there must, that's to say a kind of where there's misrepresentations to the revenue, there must in addition be a misrepresentation expressed or implied to the revenue as to the facts if the contract is to be tainted by illegality of performance. That was the case in Miller and Karlinsky and in Salverson and Simons. At 41, towards the bottom of the page, addressing Damon, as I said, it's only fair to point out that Lord Justice Lloyd expressly refrains from expressing a view as to the correctness of the decision. The third case to which I'd have regard, and this is very brief, is the Quashy case. Tab 25, sorry, it's page 241. You were shown this earlier by my learned friend. Paragraph 78 and 79 of his honour judgment mine. And my learned friend is right to say that Quashy was referred to the tribunal in this case and appears to be the test that was followed. I, I have no hesitation in saying that because I, I had a look at my opening submissions again this morning and I reminded myself that I asked the tribunal, put this in front of the tribunal and I said that this represented the law. So I, I'm, I, I'm not going to resile from that now, but it, it, if there was any doubt about what the tribunal did, I'm happy to, to quash it whether I was right or wrong to do so. I asked the tribunal to apply the test at the, at the beginning of paragraph 79, cited in my opening submissions. Contract is performed illegally if the claimant knowingly makes false returns to HMRC on a scale above what might be described as the minor faults in McConnell. My learned friend says that's the wrong test. But I say it's the correct test. And this is where I come back to the question that my Lord or Justice Baker asked me yesterday. What does it mean, sufficient knowledge or sufficient participation? Actually, what it means in the context of an employment revenue case, it means representations, false returns above 
a small level. That's why, in the cases to which I've just referred, Salverson and Damon, ignoring the way that they're approached, these are cases where the defence of illegality succeeds. They are looked at by the Court of Appeal in Hall and Wollstone Hall and in Enfield and Payne, and in at least one case is express agreement with the conclusion. The case before this court is of a completely different order in terms of illegality. Sustained over seven years, complete at the very least, I'm ignoring the post-2014 arguments that I ran. I don't even need them for this principle. Sustained independent commission of illegal activity over seven years. It is true to say that you can't find an authority expressly requiring recanting or repayment, but it is just too obvious to be said. The claimant, even today, has benefited, continues to benefit, from the, from the monies which have not been paid to the revenue. Nor even the penalties, just the basic sums that haven't been paid to the re revenue over that period of time with no participation by the respondent. The illegality in that case, in our case, especially when one looks at the reason for dismissal, looks at the reason from dis for dismissal as dispute over £34,000, £37,000, or a failure to pay the taxes, it's actually all two sides of the same coin. It is of a different league of seriousness. Now, how can it be the case that the Court of Appeal has appro effectively approved the way that the law has developed, as exemplified in cases like Salverson and Damon and others. And we come to a position that in a case such as this, far more serious, far more one-sided in our submission, in terms of the illegality demonstrated, one reaches an opposite conclusion. In my submission, if this appeal is dismissed. It has the effect of completely resetting the law in employment illegality cases. Not nudging the needle, but completely resetting the law. In circumstances where only some seven or eight months ago, a seven justice constitution, seven justice panel of the Supreme Court formally expressed agreement with the decision of the court, this court in Ocadena and Chicali as to Hall and that line of authority correctly representing the law as to the deployment of the illegality principle in this kind of case. With the avoidance of doubt, Lord Hamden, I appreciate that my Lord saw it yesterday, at paragraph 76 of his judgment. In Henderson. In Henderson. In Henderson. Referred to the knowledge plus participation test. And that's all it is. It is just knowledge plus participation. The question, when is there sufficient participation? simply serves to exclude cases where there, is mo where there are minor transgressions. <clears throat> now, I do accept, because I'm not, I don't want to be taking a, uh, an unnecessarily or unrealistically blinkered approach to this, but there may be cases where the hard edges of the knowledge plus participation rule may be blunted by a, an application of Patel and Merza factors or a, a, a more mechanistic application of, of, of Patel and Merza in an individual case. For example, the employee who recants and repays everything. I can see strong policy grounds in such a case. for saying, in those circumstances, public policy would not be served. The competing public policy principles would not be served by depriving her of her claim. But the broad thrust of the law is that knowledge plus participation is enough. Whatever the level of participation, whatever the level of illegality above a certain de minimis level. 
And this case has both of those features in spades. There's no point criticising the employment tribunal's analysis when the only real dispute between the parties was whether there had been illegality at all. That all turned on the, 30, the, the net gross argument. Once that was determined against the claimant, knowledge and participation fell into place. It is an exercise in futility, in my submission, seeking to pick apart the Employment Tribunal's analysis for expressions of a test which it completely understood. No other outcome, in my submission, was available. Now, my Lords have it that our primary submission is that the only outcome available in this case was the one that the Tribunal reached, the Employment Tribunal reached. On the basis of the authorities, knowledge plus participation, this is a bad case. Whether they got it absolutely right in every element doesn't really matter because looked at standing back and looking at it as a whole there is only one answer they could have reached. We say that even remitting it to the tribunal on the facts that have been found by the tribunal would amount to a resetting of the law of employment uh, 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 of illegality in employment cases. It would effectively involve rewriting knowledge and, pl and plus participation. But if I'm wrong about that, <coughs> then remitting is the answer. Um, well, does it follow from your submission that in the period 2014 to 2017, the claimant uh, could not have sued for her wages, even though she lawfully worked? And did every, let's say she did everything the employer requires her to do. But in the period twenty fourteen to seventeen. Yes. No. Why not? Because the, there would be the illegality, which you say is there. Even if you leave aside events after twenty fourteen, you say that the seven years of illegality up to twenty fourteen is enough to deny this claim. So why isn't the it enough to deny her claim to me, sue for wages? So, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, can I make it clear that I am particularly focused on the dismissal claims, the unfair dismissal? I know, I know, but what I want to know is what the correct legal principle is that we should apply. Uh, on your case, what is the legal distinction between the unfair dismissal claim and her ability or inability to sue for her wages for work done in those three years? The... Um It may be that in an employment tribunal context, there's no distinction at all. I can see from an underlying policy perspective that in respect to one, there is the possibility of arguing for a quantum merit. That's certainly the way that uh, Lord Sumption approached it. I appreciate he was in the minority in uh, Patel and Mirza, but encountering this particular problem. And one of the effects of Patel and Mirza may be, in some cases, to involve a reconsideration of the all or nothing knowledge participation approach. But you, you'll recall, of course, that these cases, knowledge plus participation, arises out not of wages claims, but out of dismissal claims, unfair dismissal claims. There is another answer to my Lord's question, which is this. In practice, an individual isn't going to go three years without their wages. <clears throat> but we can see from blue chip that the courts will on occasion say you cannot recover your wages. Forget that's actually not quite right, in fact, because blue chip it was it was the, the deficit with the national minimum wage rather than the wages in total. <coughs> but the principle, it seems to me, is the same. Of course, I, um, we, we don't rely on blue chip, quite, quite the opposite. We say it has no application in this case. But as an English, and even allowing for the fact that it's a statutory illegality case, one can see instances where the court will say, notwithstanding that you, the worker, have provided your labour, you have done so in circumstances where public, public policy means that we will not facilitate 
your attempt to recover your wages. We're not in that case, are we? This case is. Can I just very briefly, I'm conscious of the time, I know my, my learned friend may want to reply in, in relation to interim relief in any event. I just have a, a, a few miscellaneous points, if I may, in relation to illegality, which came out of my, my Lord's exchanges with my learned friend yesterday. It appears that I have lots of more points to read about. <laughs> It's every time you say you've finished and you're about to move on. <laughs> so that's when the message arrives. <laughs> yes. Well, I wonder if Mr. Greaves would like to stand up here and do it. Uh, the... Sorry, well, just give me one moment. I beg yes, your Yes, can I just go back to a point about qualifying service? That this, this, uh, the, 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 uh, I made the point that it was arbitrary and, uh, and unprincipled. Why should it make a difference if there were two years clean service followed by two years bad rather than the other way around? In terms of the deployment of the defence of illegality. It may be happenstance as to which comes first. It might affect the question of... Um connection between the reason for dismissal and, and the illegality. It might, but it might not. That's not about that's not about the order of events. That's about looking discreetly at the reason for dismissal. That that brings me on to, to, to the reason for dismissal. Um, which at times, yes, I think it was my my Lord Lord Justice Singh was having regard to forty one and forty two in Hall and Wollstone uh, and Wollstone Hall and the observations um, of the court there, the sense that the connection closeness of the claim and indeed I think there was reference indeed by my uh, learned friend this morning to some of the observations in Stoffel and Guandona at paragraph 26 Lord Lloyd-Jones about the need to scrutinise the details of the claim I appreciate that sits somewhat uneasily with the suggestion that we've also got Hall and Wollstone Hall which, is, which provides the test in this sort of case but even assuming that it's a necessary requirement or a desirable requirement in some cases to perform a careful detailed analysis of the claim which is being presented which is sought to be defeated by the illegality principle where does that leave us in this case the claimant was warned by the respondent on the 20 formally on the 23rd of March 2017 I've been asking you to do this for years to sort your tax affairs out if you don't agree to pay your tax back I will have no choice but to terminate followed by the termination letter which my lords have seen the finding of the tribunal defeating the claim of automatic unfair dismissal by reason of having made protected disclosures was that the reason for the claimant's dismissal by the respondent was the con effectively the deadlock of the, the dispute over whether it was £37,000 gross or net. But that is not a conceptually distinct issue from the underlying question of what happened in the period 2007 to 2014. The respondent's contention, accepted by the tribunal, was that payment was made gross and the claimant was responsible for payment of the taxes. And she dodged them. She, again, I have to pay tribute to the exceptional advocacy of Ms Williams, who managed to spend almost a day on her feet without really talking about what her client did to take it neutrally over seven years. It was a tax dodge, which she perpetuated by trying to ask, the, by maintaining, representing rather, that uh, she was always paid net rather than gross. That's why she was dismissed. The nexus between the reason for dismissal in other words, the illegality and the, and, the, and the claim brought is incredibly close. Much closer than in most claims. <clears throat> so 
So when one returns to the coherence of public policy, one of the two maxims that underpin the whole trio of considerations developed by Lord Salson at paragraph 100 onwards, it is a particularly acute example of it in this case because of that nexus between the, the claim brought and the illegality complained of. When all said and done, all we actually have post 2014, and I'm not going to repeat my submissions about whether this is a, an illusory watershed or if there's something into it, but all assuming for the sake of argument that it is some form of watershed, all we really have after that period of time is uh, after 20 after 2014 is a fluxion of time. It's the only thing that happens. That is not a satisfactory or sufficient basis to unravel what would otherwise be, in my submission, the successful deployment of the illegality defence. My Lords, unless I can assist with other ways of that, our submissions in reply. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Fanny. Yes, Ms. Williams. May it please your Lordship, I'll be brief. Uh, in relation to uh, the reply concerning the interim relief report, just really a few very specific points that arise from my learned friend's submission. I'm not going to repeat matters that I've already covered. Firstly, he made reference to the fact that pursuant to the contract continuation order the claimant w had received, would receive tax free payments. In fact, as you'll see from the Stuart 1 and Stuart 2 orders, the payments were made net. It may be this, I may, may <laughs> understand from my learned friend's intervention. I might have misunderstood what he was saying. But in any event, it's common ground between us that she received the payments net insofar as payments were made. Uh, second uh, point uh, my learned friend referred uh, in the context of taking you to the latter paragraphs of uh, Lord Justice Underhill's decision in the Jaffrey case to uh, Section 35.1 of the Employment Tribunal Act uh, and the powers that the Employment Appeal Tribunal has on an appeal. Um, if I may be forgiven for stating the obvious, but as the Jaffrey decision itself makes very clear, those powers are circumscribed by the well-established principles that were recapped by the court in that case. So there isn't an untrammeled power to make the same orders as the Employment Tribunal uh, would have power to do, and the um, theorising which my learned friend then engaged in uh, was plainly not the basis upon which Mr Justice Lewis made his decision, and I really intend to say no more than that about that point. In terms of consequences, this is a different point, my learned friend said that the claimant has to win each of her grounds of appeal, or four, in order to succeed in substantive terms in relation to interim relief, my Lord, is not correct. Ground one is alternative to two and three, because ground one goes to the question of whether the Stuart two order should have been set aside at all. I've only dealt with that point very briefly, because I have nothing to add to what um, the brief point was made in our skeleton. But if we are unsuccessful in ground one, it doesn't preclude ground two, far from it, ground two is alternative to that there was an error of law in not remitting if or on the basis that the contract continuation order was set aside. And ground three simply augments ground two. Except we would also have to win on ground four because otherwise ground two it would be an illusory victory if it was uh, nonetheless uh, appropriate for the order to be reconsidered. Uh, so the reality is we need to win on ground two and ground four. Um, or Ground three is an alternative to ground two, but more realistically, ground two and ground four. But it is not the case that we need to win on all four uh, grounds. Uh, my learned friend made reference to uh, the broad terms of Rule 70 in the context of his submissions about the power in the tribunal to reconsider. And effectively says, well, it's wide enough to cover the kind of scenario that we are here dealing with. About that we make two points. Uh, firstly, 
uh, and we did state this in our, in our skeleton for the Lake and Dry Covenant um, terms in my oral submission, uh, we say that the wording of Rule 70 must be read subject to the clear parliamentary intention in the primary legislation that is the interim relief provisions of the Employment Rights Act and the sister provisions uh, in the uh, trade union legislation and so forth. And secondly, and this is the one point where I may trespass into repetition, but to remind your lordships of it in this context, we say that in any event it is in inept, inapt even, to characterise this kind of scenario as one where it becomes necessary in the interests of justice to reconsider, because the sheer fact, and really my learned friend has no more than that in a case such as the present, the sheer fact that a different decision has been reached in terms of substantive outcome and a grant of interim relief does not in itself give rise to an injustice. Uh, next, just a short discreet point, uh, my learned friend said that it was agreed in effect between the parties that Stuart 3 was as erroneous as Stuart 2. Uh, uh, my lord, there's not a entirely accurate characterisation of the uh, claimant's position. I didn't take you to Stuart 3 before because of the interest of time, but I wonder if we could just look at it very briefly now. I just want to draw your attention to one particular power. So it's page 249 in the documents bundle. We say that in paragraph 10, whatever else he may or may not have done, employment just Stuart did get it right in his central point here in paragraph 10. I doubt whether the concept of reconsidering a judgment regarding interim relief in the interest of justice is broad enough to justify the variation of that judgment on the basis of the eventual dismissal of the claims brought that the application for relief was based on. Spot on, we say, for the reasons that I have developed. So to write he then did go on to develop a, a secondary point, which one sees uh, in particular paragraph 13 onwards about uh, other remedies which he said would be available. We, we didn't rely on that analysis below and I don't rely on it now. So to, to, to that extent we do part company with employer Judge Stewart's secondary reason, but we say that he was right in his central reason that we have just looked at in paragraph 10. You already have in paragraph 84 in our skeleton the reference to two illustrations we've given. We didn't have to look very far uh, to, to, to show uh, that in cases where the time scale was nothing particularly unusual, uh, 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 they could run up against a situation where interim relief was being redetermined post or at the same time or thereabouts of the substantive hearing. So we keep hearing from the um, respondent that the situation in this case is so unusual, so unique. Uh, my laws we don't accept uh, that um, that Ms. is... Ms. Williams, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just trying to see where this sits in the overall structure of the argument. Is this under ground four? Uh, my lord, yes. Yeah. Um, I just would welcome your help on this point. Suppose we didn't have the appeal to Mr Justice Lewis on the interim order we just had the appeal to him on the uh, reconsideration repeal. Yes, so Stuart too was delayed, but correct on... Correct. Yeah, so, so let, let, let's say either that Mr Justice Lewis doesn't have an appeal in front of him against Stuart too, or he does, but he dismisses it because he says there was nothing wrong in law with it. What would, on your submission, what, what would then happen to the reconsideration appeal? It seems to me, at least, that all that would be being said is we now know the outcome of the final hearing. The claimant lost, and therefore you should reconsider your earlier decision. Precisely so, uh, my lord, and for all the reasons that I um, submitted uh, earlier this afternoon, indeed this morning, 
we say that that is not a scenario that engages the necessary in the interests of justice um, uh, threshold test. But would you accept that, at least in principle, the jurisdiction might exist in, for example, an extreme case where the interim application, it turned out eventually, but only as a result of the final decision, was based on a forged witness statement, something of that sort? So it's not the mere fact yes. of the different outcomes. Yes. That's what I'm getting at. Yes, I, I understand the point. I can certainly see that it would be a lot more, uh, the proposition would be a lot more meritorious in, the, in, in those circumstances. My Lord, yes. It, obviously, it's not the, the situation. I totally understand why you're asking me to test the yeah. boundaries, the parameters of the, of the propositions. I don't want to go as far as to formally concede that uh, Rule 70 would be engaged there, but I can certainly see that it would be a much more meritorious position than really is entirely without merit to say simply because there is a different outcome uh, in the um, substantive uh, hearing that the interest of justice test uh, is um, engaged. Um, and then I think uh, very lastly my learned friend suggested that there is no, there's nothing the claimant could complain about in the reverse situation if the claimant um, failed in their interim relief application then won the substantive hearing, it, it, it appears to us that there, there would be a consequence of the contract not having continued potentially, and that relates to the basic award, which as I mentioned this morning was your Lordship from Earth, calculated by the number of years service, so if the years fell because it's based on complete year service, uh, then it could make a monetary difference to the claimant uh, if the contract has not been extended pursuant to a contract continuation order, or indeed uh, reinstatement or renewal. So, uh, uh, that was, uh, my lords, unless I can assist you further, that was the last point that I wanted to mention, because I can just check that there's nothing else in terms of that. Well, thank you very much. We'll, we'll just rise for two minutes to take stock of where we are. All right. <coughs>
rise. Mr. Laddie and Miss Williams, we're, we're extremely grateful to you both for <coughs> submissions which on both sides, if we may say so, have been of the, the highest quality. And we're very grateful to those uh, behind you and uh, behind the scenes who've assisted in preparing the case for the, for the hearing. Um, unsurprisingly, we will reserve our, our judgments. Um, in the usual way, <coughs> uh, drafts will be circulated for corrections of typographical errors and any obvious uh, factual errors, not of course for re-argument, and we'll um, <coughs> aim to hand down the judgment without the need for any further uh, hearing which anyone needs to attend. I if in the light of the draft judgment the parties could please liaise and try to agree uh, a draft order and any consequential matters, if, if there are points of contention uh, we will aim to deal with those by brief written submissions and uh, we'll deal with them on the papers. All right. All right. Thank you again. <laughs>